Exactly. Exactly. I have the exact man for the exact job of exactly what to say. Mr. Phil M. Jones, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. It is a joy to be here. Great to be able to hang with you today. So have we ever found out what the M stands for? I could let you guess. I mean, that could be fun, but um, or I could give you the honest, boring answer. Which way do you want to go? Let's go with the honest, boring answer. The honest, boring answer is my middle name is Michael. And the reason that the M has always played a prominent part of my personal brand is, is there are a lot of Phil Joneses in this world. In, in particular, there is a famous soccer player in the UK who was hedged to be an England captain, Manchester United centre back, um, and, and had some, some, some evidence out there in the world of Google and all that um, made him quite difficult to nudge off top spot. So I can be the one and only Phil M. Jones, but I cannot be the only Phil Jones. So I figured I'd take some open water. Very, very nice. I like it. And I, I know people have been clamoring. They've been clamoring to know. It's like, is it Miles? Is it Merrill? Is it is it Meredith? You know, because of course in England, Meredith can be both a male name and you know, a you female know. name. Who I, knew? I think people have been up at night and, and really pondering that question for quite some time. So it's good news that we've cleared this up for them. Dude, it's been great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. <laughs> Please come again. <laughs> All right, let's let's dig in to the exactly what to say empire. Tell us a little bit, because I know that the earlier versions of the book and the work, it was called Magic Words. And yeah. at first it was just one of many things that you did with sales training and relationship building and helping, be, helping people be more effective at their work. But give us from the germ of the idea through to where it is today, what was the evolution of the exactly what to say movement? Oh, man. I mean, there's a long part of this in, in the you know, magic words and, and the sprinkling in of precise word choices to influence behavior has been part of my body of work since I started delivering sales training programs back in 2008. And, and, and it started to become the like the fun takeaway that people would remember two years, three years, four years past them being in a program. They're like, hey, still using those magic words. So I then started to be able to do more with it where it was a, a speech and a PDF giveaway for lead capture. It, it, it was there. Then I wrote a little book called Magic Words in 2011 that came from the bet at a mastermind group with some other speaker, trainer, coach friends of mine that they said how hard it was to publish a book. I said it could be done within two weeks and then had to put my money where my mouth was and, and, and deliver on that promise. So Magic Words was created from there. It was the expansion of a two-page PDF that became that first book. And that book did well on Kindle and was you know, a fun giveaway at the end of events. And we'd used it as a lead capture in websites and all sorts of things. Then 2017, I went through my geographic move here to the United States of America from the UK and decided I needed to write a new book. And I thought that would get me more visibility with the speaker bureaus, move from a global speaking business to a, a national speaking business here in North America. And um, then had this strong realization on why on earth would you write a nude book, you idiot, when um, you have a really good book, a really well received idea, and you should probably just do it properly. And exactly what to say became the rewrite of Magic Words. It became doing it correctly. And I kind of viewed it as if you were a musician and you had a successful single or EP, I need to be able to finish the album. And that's what exactly what to say became in 2017. The book's gone on to do remarkably well. As I talked to you today, we're at about 1.7 million copies translated into 30 plus languages. Um, it's custom edition into the world of real estate is the most successful book in the world of real estate. Exactly what to say is the most listened to nonfiction audio book on audible.com. It, it's had quite, quite a ride. And following that same viewpoint of success leaves clues and let's ride the horse the way it's facing is we're just leaning further and further into all things exactly what to say. So now um, we license um, other successful trainers, coach consultants to be able to embody the work into their work and deliver workshop speeches, consult to their clients, utilizing frameworks and methodology from exactly what to say, creating partners and a community around that, which has been huge. 
And quite simply, David, is is in the same way that Rick Astley is not giving up on never going to give you up and and, and and Cy is not giving up on Gangnam Style, is I think I'm going to be the guy that hopefully on my tombstone reads like loving husband, great father and author of exactly what to say. Like that's that's where we're going on this. I'm just building a building a world around this that is far bigger than a book and something that is sustainable. And I set my aspirations and heights towards people like Dale Carnegie and what they've done with how to win friends and influence people. It's like, hey, if we build a body of work that has that kind of staying power, that's what we're shooting for. Wow. 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 Well, it's funny that you bring up Dale Carnegie because, of course, Dale Carnegie wrote many books. The the runaway legacy by far book is as you said how to win friends and influence yep. people uh doubling down tripling down 10xing down on something that is proven to work that goes against most entrepreneurs natural instinct yep. they always want to move on to the next thing the new thing the shiny thing but you know phil i like to be creative i like to invent i love building new programs i love writing new books and i've always felt that this whole consultant expert every two three years come out with a new book you are completely shortchanging whatever that initial book's success was about now, if the initial book wasn't successful, then it's a different story. But you also came out with exactly how to sell yep. and then exactly how to start. And those did well, but I'm guessing nowhere near as huge as exactly what to say. Talk about those intermediate books and what are the lessons learned from those? Yeah, for sure. And, and, and... So exactly what to say is a tiny little book. There's a lot of strategy around it. Also, I own the IP of that book. So I own that through to the core, own all of its publishing rights. Was approached by a major New York publisher when we bought that book to market to look to be able to buy the rights of that book from me. And I said, no, thank you. Well, long story short, we agreed to do a different book deal, two new books. And if I was to bring two alternative books to market with a traditional um, New York publisher, is I didn't want to bring books to market that would sabotage the success of exactly what to say. So if I could put some weight behind exactly what to say with these alternative books, then I would be okay to be able to do it. So that was where we decided upon the titles and the branding that was similar. And what they do is they almost create like a, like a trifecta now is we've got exactly how to sell, exactly where to start and exactly what to say. Now, exactly what to say is typically the tip of that arrow. And then behind it is exactly how to sell, which says, hold on, Phil has got some chops and some expertise here, short of this little pet book you can read cover to cover in 70 minutes. Exactly where to start is very much a tool for my entrepreneurial journey. And I meet a lot of people that are like, how do you start an idea? What do you do to get an idea to a business? And lots of people write books around how you can be super successful in business. Very few people have put pen to paper about how you can just turn idea into something that exists and operates and is sustainable. And I get asked questions around that a lot. So that book exists for me to say, hey, read this, then come back to me more so than me needing to offer free consultation everywhere when somebody wants to start a business. So they were strategically positioned, but never with the intent that I was going to push these things to be able to grow to the to the hewest of degrees, mostly down to the fact that there is significantly less margin in them. There's significantly less scale in them. When you think strategically about a book, exactly what to say is a book for everybody in every audience that I speak. Exactly where to start is a book for three people in every thousand person audience that I speak at. Wow. Exactly how to sell is for 25 people in every thousand person audience that I speak in. So sometimes it isn't even like how good it is that, that, that you market this thing. Is, is there a relevant and rich enough audience for this to be able to operate at scale? And sometimes the answer is no. So those books provide a very nice comprehensive shop front, but it is definitely a, you know, a lead actor and, and a support cast. Yes, for sure. Well, talking about lead actors and support casts, let's talk about your theatrical endeavors and your amazing Audible uh, audiobook, How to oh, Persuade so and Get Paid. 
like you said about this one's for everyone. This is for 3%. This is for 25%. The sales workshop for everyone. Yeah. Talk about how that came to be and what it was like to be in the theater and record that and sort of where, where that has evolved to. I mean, that is still one of my greatest personal and professional achievements today. Um, and when you have some success with Audible, you can find yourself in conversations and at tables that otherwise you wouldn't have been. And, and, and I found myself having a cocktail with one of the um, the new editors uh, and producers of Audible that was responsible for um, experimental projects and um, looking to be able to acquire new talent. And it just so happened that I was catching up with them at the exact same time that they'd secured a deal to be able to rent the Mineta Lane Theater under the goal of producing original content in theatrical fashion to host on audible.com and provide unique experiences towards their listener base. This was 2018 or so, 2000, yeah, pretty early 2018. So I ended up pitching them an idea and said, how about this is how about we use that theater experience before you've got programming, which they're only working on for 2019, where we look to do something in this infotainment category, where we look to produce something that's never been done before. Now, I started a sales training business in 2008. The foundation of that sales training business was a one-day workshop that would help just about anybody to improve their skills as professional salespeople, to present price better, to overcome objection better, to be able to present their products and services in a way that represented value. And it was very well received for helping non-salespeople understand a methodology that had them feel that they could sell with confidence, with integrity, and without feeling quote-unquote salesy. I didn't have the bandwidth to deliver this workshop in 12, 15, 20 person at a time at this point in my career, but I didn't want to give it up. So I pitched Audible on the fact of how would you feel if what we did is we delivered a one-time, one-man show that allowed anybody and everybody to access that workshop as an Audible member without charge or a low $20 charge, et cetera, and me be able to provide an answer that when anybody wanted that content, it was like, you don't need to hire me. Just, just grab it from audible.com. And yes, it was a theatrical performance. I did a one-man show for eight hours of, of delivering a workshop. But the objective was, was to put the audible listener in the audience so that what somebody can do is they can be listening to it and feel like they're there, feel like they're just a fly on the wall. And we captured the audience participation. We captured this live. And we produced something that I feel delivers on that promise that it gives somebody a seminar or workshop-like experience without them of needing to be able to travel there and be in New York. The fun thing for me was it needed to be done in one take. Obviously, you remove every tool that you might have used to deliver a workshop in the past. Flip charts are no use, PowerPoints are no use, physical hand gestures are no use because the end product only has audio. So obviously it needs to be able to deliver in that environment that the listener is the primary, right? There was a few hundred people in the theater, but the primary listener was the finished product, i.e. the thousands of people that have now gone to be able to listen to this on Audible. And we are you know, 100, 150,000 people have gone through that program on, on audible.com. Um, and it's really good, but dang, it was fun, buddy. Damn, it was fun. Like being, you know, bar stall me, chair, microphone, um glass of water felt like felt like jerry seinfeld for a day shall we say in the in, in in a one-man show it was cool absolutely i'm curious before we leave the topic how did you prepare for that one day and the whole thing was filmed in one day correct right. one take one, one, one take. day one take how did you what, what was the preparation process like how much did you rehearse or or outline or map out what you wanted to do well let's remember also this was a decade old body of my work. So did I need to rehearse and prepare extensively? Yes. But I was working from a lot of muscle memory, a lot of reps and a lot of experience. Sure. The rehearsal and the prep was decision making around how I'd use the space, how I'd make considerations of delivering points differently given the circumstances how we'd be able to then collaborate with the producers so that they could capture the right audio in the right scenarios, because there was a huge amount of trust from Audible's point of view. They had no idea what I was going to deliver. 
like they bought the concept based on a two pager. And then it was on me to be able to deliver it. There wasn't a detailed scripting process. There wasn't, hey, walk me through what it is you're going to do. I'm going to like, we're going to record this in four parts. There's going to be a break. Uh, well, uh, you know, we're going to run for around 90 minutes. There's going to be a 15 minute break. We're going to run for around 90 minutes. There's going to be a 45 minute lunch. We're going to run for about 90 minutes. And then there's going to be a 15 minute break. We're going to run for about 90 minutes and we're going to close. But to give you an understanding of, of the ability to do that, and know that what you can do is get towards the outcome that has been promised, over deliver on the outcome that's been promised, provide an experience for everybody who's traveled to be in the room and do it all within the time constraints of one day isn't something you should be doing for the first time. Is to be able to carry the weight of that responsibility, you need to know what you're doing. And, and the big realization for me that I knew what I'm doing came to me at the end of that event, more so than even at the start of it. Partway through the event, this was being recorded in New York City. New York City is not short of construction projects. So partway through, um, we are dealing with some jackhammer noise, which I'm pretty sure the Audible listener does not want to experience in the finished product at a two or three points through the day. End of the day, exhausted, standing ovation, round of applause. Um, producer says, hey, we've got a couple of pickups to do. Do you need me to run playback? Do we need to work on this? Do you want to keep the audience? Um, and thought that we'd need to stay behind for another two, three, four hours to be able to work through the pickups. And in the moment with the live audience, I would just said, well, throw me the last line. And then we'll run it again live. Throw me, you know, And 11 minutes later, we've done all the pickups. And, and it resulted in, which I didn't even realize was so much of a big deal. It resulted in a second standing ovation from the live audience that was like, holy dang, like end of an eight hour seminar, et cetera, to be able to do your own pickups in real time, um, still with the same level of energy and, and vigor. And I guess the only reason I'm sharing that is so many of these big opportunities look like people got lucky or that they, um, why not me or why not? It is I delivered that workshop material over 2,500 times which then gave both me an audience and a brand like Audible confidence to say, we can probably can this. For sure. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that literally is when preparation, massive preparation meets pretty darn big opportunity, right? And then yeah. boom, there you go. Um, engineered luck, as they say. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Something like that. So let me ask you this from the exactly what we have a lot of other territory to cover because I definitely want to talk about certified guides. I want to talk about bourbon. I want to talk yes. about children's book. Uh, before we get to that, we are in late 22, early 2023. There's all this talk of recession, depression, crisis, downturn, every you know, sky is falling with you and your audiences and even your certified guides. What are in the exactly what to say methodology when we are selling to someone who is mildly panicked, risk averse, but oh, Phil, we, we'd love to do this. We got budget cuts. We'd love to do this. We're doing hiring freezes. We would totally love to bring you in, but that doesn't look good. We just laid off 25% of our people. How do we talk to someone who is in crisis mode and very much needs and wants what we do? Okay. The first thing I'd say is that if you're getting to the point of that objection, you're already up against it. it is our awareness of that needs to help people in their decision making process by realizing that that you are worth it before they find out how much you are. They need to know that ahead of time. So your early conversations should probably recognize that we are dealing with people who are in times of chaos. And in so, so if we look at where we are in 2022, I was explaining this to a group yesterday, is when you look at 2019, 2020, 2021, with a, with a COVID piece and all of the demonstrable amounts of change that were presented upon businesses through that period of time, the world externally applied chaos onto businesses. And what those businesses wanted to be able to buy was order. 
And whether that order was that you could help with productivity in a work from home environment, whether that order was is you could teach folks to be able to be more effective on Zoom, whether that order was that what you could do is to help them with their retention issue. They wanted order because the world was in chaos. Strangely enough, where we currently are is we're now back into a new order. You might not like it, but the new order is that inflation is here and interest rates are here and hybrid work is real and people have made decisions about how many days somebody's come in the office or not and organizations have restructured and given reconsideration towards what's now normal. Budgets have been set with some purpose. Now, all of a sudden, whether you like it or not, there is a set of forward facing plans that says this is us. We have created new order. When new order has been created, the thing that you need to excite people with is chaos. So what do you have to do is you have to show them that you can help create a beautiful mess that is going to be worth then tidying up again afterwards. So what this means is in your conversations with folks is you have to understand where they're looking to go and then create a version that's better in that working alongside yourself and then present them a price point for it that is about a tenth or less of the size of the impact that this can make. The question that everybody is asking when they're looking to be excited about working with you is, are you worth it? Now, I don't care whether you think you're worth it, it's are you worth it to them? And if you cannot articulate your worth to them in a way that is at least 10 times worth the money you're asking them to invest in you, forget about it. It's too big of a risk on them. So if you want to charge somebody $10,000, prove that you are going to, in a short period of time, make or save them $150,000 plus. If you want somebody to spend a million dollars with you, prove to them that you're going to save them or make them in a reasonably short period of time, at least 10 to $15 million incremental as a result of your involvement. If you take that level of mindset, you'll never have a price objection again in your life. And that is that is pre-framing and that is almost we almost bring it up before they have a chance to think of the objection yes. about this new, exciting, faster path to a result that they want, despite the chaos. I'm sorry, despite well, chaos slash order, despite their current circumstance, or even because of their current circumstance. Right. This is why they are ideally positioned now to take action. Correct. And in times of change, people are always looking for reasons to change and things that are going to help them navigate this change. There is, there is never a bad time for coaches, consultants, trainers to be able to grow a business. Never. There is only positioning. And your positioning needs to meet the market where it's at and where the market's where it's going. And the mistake I see on repeat is people are using an old positioning for a modern market and, and wondering why it misses. So if we're saying the same things and doing the same things that we were in the summer of 2021 or the fall of 2019, yeah. and here we are at the end of 22, beginning of 23, there is something grossly out of sync with our prospect's reality. Correct. And the positioning needs to always change. And even if we just think about this very simply from a, if you're in the business of selling food, there was a time where what you wanted to be able to say is that, you know, you know, this has no added salt. There was a time where you wanted to say that this is organic and homegrown. There was a time where you wanted to be able to say that this is free of gluten. There is a time where you want to be able to say that this is, you know, vegan and or grass fed or like it's always positioning. And, and positioning always matters. And I think as coaches, consultants, trainers is, is we're not quick enough to shift our positioning sometimes in line with the market. Bottles of Coca-Cola now say 100% pure cane sugar. Mm -hmm. Like that used to be like, oh no, that's death. That's death. We don't want that. Now it's like artificial sweeteners. Oh, horrible. All these like other hydrogenated Correct. artificial sugars. No, no. You want the Coke that has 100% pure cane sugar. Yeah, now, now it's all the sugar. Previously, it was zero added sugar, right? Um, and it's totally. always positioning. And, and, and this is what we need to get right. So when you look at the market that we're stepping into right now, it, it, it's help, you know, people have to understand that you can help them with both the relevant problem today and a problem that's likely to be relevant in the future. See, that way you can become a partner. If you haven't got both those things, you're a Band-Aid. 
And if you're a Band-Aid, then there are lots of options for Band-Aid. There and are that's very really few options for today, tomorrow, next week, and next month. Absolutely right. And that's the difference between a nice-to-have expert, consultant, trainer, speaker, and a must-have, have-to-have Correct. partner. So what are some positioning shifts that you're seeing that are either particularly clever or, or particularly effective? Do any come to mind? Well, I mean, even in the business development space. If you go back a decade, everybody wanted more leads, more opportunities. They wanted to be able to have more you know, time at bat in order to be able to create more business. So if you had the chops to be able to help somebody be able to generate more leads, you had the chops to be able to help somebody drive more traffic towards their website, you had the chops to be able to say, hey, what I can do is get you in front of more people. Chances are people would have seen that as a pretty attractive proposition. Today, people are like, I'm not short of leads. I just can't convert for toffee. So your positioning is now focused on skills and quality at the point of conversion as opposed to volume and, and noise at the top end of the funnel. Even from a marketer's point of view, we just put a new book into the world called Prove It. All right. Everybody has talked about content marketing for a long, long time about how you can attract more of the right kind of people, how you can get more people into the top end of the funnel. Uh, mine and Melanie's book, Prove It, is far more focused on the final mile in the funnel is how do you produce content assets that means that when you're in a 50-50 race, that people choose you more than they choose the other guy. And, and what we've seen is as the world has got more and more and more and more and more and more globalized, People have had the chance to scale at pace significantly. What we're now seeing, though, is that many markets are now saturated or at a point of, you know, they're pushing the walls back. There isn't much room to be able to grow. Even seeing this with the likes of you know, the big social media platforms is they're not going to have the same growth of user base over a period of time because there aren't enough people left in the world, right, to be able to create that same growth. Yeah. So now quality is the focus as opposed to quantity and reach. And um, that shift in positioning for many, if they're ahead of it, is good news. Yes. And even if you work in the HR spaces, historically, you might have wanted to focus on productivity and team building and communication. In today's world, you want to focus on retention, collaboration, understanding, and communication. Could be the exact same programs, but just with a very slight positioning pivot because the decision makers are seeing things through new lenses. Absolutely. And having that ear to the ground and being really in tune with where <clears throat> your prospects are and where their thinking is, right. <clears throat> that is the biggest clue to help you reposition from where you were a commodity to where you now are a must-have partner and resource. Correct. Correct. And, and yeah. if, in, you know, if 10 years ago you were talking productivity, today you might be looking to say, how do I create more loyalty towards my organization? Because in a work from home environment is the loyalty that's often created from being in the culture of being in the same group of people every, every day right. has disappeared. So how do you create people loyal towards your organization when they're actually on an island in a silo from that? Yes. Will it result in driving more productivity? Yes, probably. But the headline is loyalty, not productivity. Really, really smart. Well, let's move on and talk about the certified guides. Uh, talk mm -hmm. about the certified guide program, how this idea sort of came to fruition and where things are heading in the next year or two. Yeah, for sure. And, and the, the body of work around exactly what to say has reached a, a really solid level of maturity, a solid level of maturity to a point that... <clears throat> I know with great certainty, I can't get it to all the corners of the world I'd like to by myself. And I'm so at peace with that, that I can now give the work away. There is not anything within my immediate future that I have goals and aspirations of a stage that I want to be able to perform from or a milestone that I want to hit with the books or an award that et cetera, I'm looking to be able to achieve. And I've tested the work through so many different lenses that I know I can't break it. So knowing I can't break it means that I can give it away and allow other people to be able to carry it forward 
without fear of the work being sabotaged or the work being misinterpreted or misrepresented. And what was happening is I was getting lots of people tell me they were running trainings or they were working my material through their audience. And I got to a point where I'm not sure I feel about this. Do I feel like, yay, or do I feel like you are? Like, there's my IP. Um, and my conclusion on that was, my general feeling was, yay, like, I love it. Like, if you are a music artist, again, which gives me more clues than most people in our training, coaching, consulting space, I learn more from the music industry than I do from, from our world, is, you know, Ed Sheeran does not get frustrated that somebody is singing one of his songs in a karaoke bar. Right. That is not a thing you worry about. In fact, you should be pretty darn chuffed if somebody is murdering your music in a karaoke bar. Like that is a sign of the fact that you've got something worth going somewhere. And Louis Vuitton are, are actually proud of the fact that their bags are counterfeited in, in parts of the Far East and that people are happy to pay a premium fee for a less than perfect version of saying. And, and, and the more and more I studied that, the more and more I was like, oh, OK. So what I've got is I've got the me version. I've got these counterfeit versions that are going to happen everywhere and I can't stop them. And then I've got great people that are champions and ambassadors of the work that sit somewhere between that. The I need to create a way of being able to delineate from the counterfeit versions and say that what we have got is we have got with permission versions that we can help understand the work to a greater level and also empower them to be able to go do more with it than what I can do on my own, knowing that actually done right, two plus two could equal five. Give you one of the greatest examples is uh, a young lady called Jen now is one of our certified guides. She specializes in the world of parenting. She specializes in the area of being able to help either broken families to be able to have more effective conversations with exes or parents have more effective conversations with their teens. This is not an area of my expertise. And I don't ever intend it to be. In fact, I'm, I'm like, I can understand principles, but I do not have the chops in this space. Jen is now running programs called exactly what to say to break through to your team. Using my body of work and her expertise, combining those two things together to be able to take the work to corners of the world that I wouldn't have got it to otherwise. And the thing with certified guides is they stand in front of the brand. Whereas when you look at other people's coaching accreditations, et cetera, quite often you're asking for them to stand behind it. So you've got Tony Robbins or um, Maxwell's or you know these folks of the world. It's I'm a John Maxwell certified coach because John Maxwell's a badass and John Maxwell is a badass. But I feel like what it does is it, it, it creates a pyramid of a system top down. Whereas everything I wanted to do with certified guides is I didn't want to be the hero in the story. I wanted the work to be the hero in the story and then create custodians of the work and people I could entrust with the work who share the same value set, who can allow the work to be able to live on at a level that is beyond. And I think that's almost a lesson that I took from meeting Dale Carnegie's work 25, 30 years ago, is there are a lot of people who have no idea what Dale Carnegie looks like that have all in some way come into contact with how to win friends and influence people in whatever area of their career, it may be impactful. And that's the success that I'm looking to be able to build from in the, in the certified guides program is to have people that grow their personal brands that just happen to be part of a community of other people who are all caring about the power of spoken word and the impact that it can have on changing outcomes who bring their own experience and expertise plus values towards this body of work and carry it further. So that's guides. We have 24 certified guides at this moment in time. We'll have, well, I know we have at least 28 by next induction in January. It's likely to be able to grow as anybody new comes towards um, induction and wants to be interviewed by me to see if they fit. Um, and I'm going to grow that community to a hundred and then have a, a powerful community of people that I care about, that I adore, that I respect, that allow us to be able to grow together where exactly what to say plays a part of it in their world. I love the notion of the guides stand in front of the brand. They're not behind the brand or under the brand. Talk a little bit, because I know you and I had a great in-person conversation a few months ago. 
talk about hot sauce. Because I think the hot <laughs> sauce analogy is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And I think it'll get people really excited about the certified guide program, just the way that you articulate it. Yeah. I, I mean, in the personal brand space, people often have what I call like a look at me approach to their marketing. It's like, I hold the gold and all roads lead back towards me, my world, this giant protection of IP and says, you know, I'm going to try and get people into my world, my followers, my team, my content, my, 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 my. And what it does is it caps you, it caps you pretty darn quickly. The approach that, that, that I've been strategically bringing to this is to think more like Tabasco sauce. And what I mean by that is there is almost always a bottle of Tabasco sauce on or near every commercial restaurant table, almost everywhere in the Western world. Almost everywhere. It never steals the show. It sometimes completes the meal, but very rarely is people like, you got to go there because they got Tabasco. Like it's not the talked about thing. It's also on every order. It gets repeat ordered by the chef, the kitchen, the production staff, whoever is. It's there. It's recurring. And if you could build something that says <clears throat> you are a powerful condiment to somebody else's success story without ever stealing the show, then what you can do is you can reach scale. If what you try to do is to steal the show, you reach capacity. And capacity prevents you from being able to operate at scale. So my thinking around helping exactly what to say reach as much of the world as I'd like it to be is to think of it like it's hot sauce and, and see how often it can be somebody's fun, powerful, potent little side dish as opposed to ever trying to be the entree. And the example of how that shows up in, in our world of guides is it's like meet Tanis Rhoda. She's a long-term experience communication coach. She runs a company called um, Elevate Your Communication, and she's helped some of the world's biggest brands do exactly that. And she just so happens to be one of our certified guides, right? Like that's the stacking of the order. It's meet this person. This person is amazing. This person has done this body of work, and they also happen to be part of our community. And you see how from an introduction point of view, that changes things on our end. Instead of me saying I've got 24 people who can deliver a two-day program around exactly what to say and they could deliver a keynote around exactly what to say and they're all the same. Uh -uh. They're all different and they're all beautifully different and they all bring beautiful different experiences. And the, the lower level common thread is they all happen to be certified guides. Love that. Love that so much. <clears throat> well, let's talk about, we have two more topics in our remaining few minutes. Uh, number one, children's book called The mm -hmm. Magic of Words. Number two, bourbon. And we can make the bourbon one quick. Talk about the, the impetus to create a book for kids. Because as you said, you're a dad, you're an amazing dad. And uh, what was, a, a, as a parent, as a very successful thought leader in this world of um, language and articulation and using the right words in the right way at the right time, what was the impetus for creating the children's book? Um, if we come back to a point I made earlier where, you know, I'm, I'm all in on everything exactly what to say. And I also believe as personal brand thought leader type businesses that, that, that we have here is that you have a responsibility to be able to create a way for just about everybody you care about to access your work in a way that's accessible to them. And that's what we should always be aiming to do, whether this is, you know, CEO movie star with gazillions of dollars that wants to hire you to be able to come in and solve an immediate one-on-one -on -one problem, or whether it's somebody in a far corner of the other side of the globe that has come across your work and wants to be able to understand it earlier. So that's why we need content that is for free on Instagram or YouTube, et cetera. And we need things at the other end of the scale that are at premium prices where people are close to the center. We need all things in between. I started to realize that, um, some of the most critical conversations that are happening in the world that are that are shaping the future of our world <clears throat> happen between parents and children, children to children, teachers and children. And I had absolutely nothing to talk to any part of those groups. So the decision was to say, um, well, wouldn't it be cool if I could distill some of the core principles of exactly what to say and, and move it into a three minute children's story a rhyming story that would 
if nothing else raise people's consciousness around just how impactful the words are that leave our mouths. And I won with this book, David, the day that I re received my first copy. Right? This was a, a passion project with some strategy attached to it. It wasn't like, hey, we're going to sell a gazillion books. It was like, I just like to have that in my arsenal, where the opportunity presents itself. We can gift it. We can share it. And the day I got to be able to read it to my littles um, was already a victory. And to bring things to life with illustration and to make conscious decisions to say that we are going to drive as much diversity into the character development as possible and, and, and create a story that raises consciousness around word choices, that was the intention. I think we delivered on that intention and what's now happening, and I'm hearing this second and third hand, is, is school teachers are using the book to be able to read to their classes and then taking a piece of prose or a single page or two and going deeper on it with seven-year-olds, five-year-olds. They're using it as a guidebook to be able to help raise kids' consciousness about something that happened in the classroom where somebody said something mean or somebody responded in a way that was selfish, self-serving or disrespectful towards somebody else's behavior. They're using it like a textbook, but without it being a textbook and using story to create metaphor, to create meaning. And that is huge. So this will live on in my body of work. Um, our certified guides gift it to people in their world. And we shared it with a number of schools. And, you know, it's already done enough work to have been worth doing. And it still keeps to be continuing to give. So I love it. I love it. Amazing. Really, really great. So there's actually two movements going on. There's the exactly what to say movement adult edition and the exactly what to say movement in the magic of words edition. Now going from children to adults, let's yeah. just wrap up with some adult beverage talk. You and I are both bourbon fans. Uh, the difference is you have your own bourbon and I am filled with FOMO. I am filled with envy. Talk about your bourbon adventures and let's talk about what it's called as well. Um, I mean, David, you and I are a fan of uh, of our American whiskeys and and bourbon normally carries the flag, but it could go to rye. It could go uh, into even some of the Japanese whiskeys, et cetera. I think we're for a, sure we're, we're prepared to be able to expand our gaze a little. Um, but loving bourbon is also one of the things is I share as a passion with a dear friend of mine who lives in Kentucky. He was the first person that introduced me to bourbon happens to be another David. So maybe there's something going on in this. And my buddy David has taken me on the bourbon trail. We've been to a number of tours together. And while we were uh, adventuring through Kentucky, going from one distillery to another, I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if we could create like our own bourbon and we could do something that was fun? And I have all this exactly brand, right? Exactly what to say, exactly where to start, exactly la, 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 right? So I'm like, I want to call it exactly what to drink. It's like, sounds awesome. He's like, I got a buddy who owns a distillery here in Kentucky. Let's get it hooked up. We can make it happen. We can do it. I'm like, great. I knew we were friends for a reason. And um, I find out a few weeks later, he's like, can't be done. Which is one of the worst things to say to me. So the result was, is I managed to connect with a distillery here in New York. In fact, it's one of the longest standing distilleries here in New York owned by a guy called Colin, called Kings County Distilleries. And Kings County make a beautiful product. Um, Kevin, um, Colin comes from a family of moonshiners out in Kentucky, has really decided to be able to create a, a craft premium bourbon here in New York. And it's been winning awards left, right and center. I'm like, well, what would it take? In fact, Charlotte, my wife, started this adventure with those guys by booking us to go on a tour there. And it was it was great. You'll love it. If you're in New York, it's in Brooklyn. It's at the Navy Yards. Part of their tour, they have a thing called the Boozeum, which, nice. which was cool. But yeah, got to be able to chat with the master distiller, et cetera. I'm like, well, what would it take for us to be able to do something? And we explored a couple of routes and we said, well, we could do we could do our own single barrel or we could do our own blend. It's purely a case of you at a commercial level purchasing that volume of, of liquid from us and us working creatively on the packaging, the branding, et cetera. And I said, well, okay, let's do it. You just write a check out and get to work. Um, 
And it was a lot of fun. We went through the whole tasting process, the proofing process. We selected our barrels. We pulled the whole thing. It was done for real. And I was planning to be able to sell it or use it as part of you know, bigger end high ticket programs or to be able to run a mastermind around bourbon where we actually said, well, what you do is you, you know, you buy a five grand ticket and that's how you get a bottle um, and be able to produce it that way. But it's, it's become something alternative. It's just become a fun talk trigger. It's been a fun gift. And I ended up owning all of the bottles and I share them with my friends. So that that is is that story. But yeah, we do now have exactly what to drink, which is a great way to um, to shake hands on some deals with fellow bourbon drinkers as well when we do business together. Yes, 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 yes. Totally love that. Well, Phil M. Jones, I'm going to let you get back to running the empire. But before we let you go, how can people get connected and stay connected to more Phil M. Jones brilliance and the entire exactly what to say movement? Where can we send people? What links can we share? For sure. If uh, if you want to catch me, um, great place to be able to just join a friendly conversation with me is Instagram. And I'm at Phil M. Jones UK. I'm there more than any of the other platforms. If you want to learn more about exactly what to say, guides, hire a guide, understand more about our philosophy, thinking, any of the content, we actually built exactly what to say.com starting around a year ago. And that has tons of articles and resources. Plus, there's a brand new um, opportunity for you to experience 31 of the magic words delivered by me and our guides in a 31 day challenge. So if you stop, stop by exactly what to say.com, you can join the challenge for free learn more about the body of work, more about the power of words, and meet me in more video, plus our 24 guides up until right now, and, and see what they're all about. So I would say exactly what to say.com or at Phil M. Jones UK, and um, we'll continue the conversation from there. Excellent. And all of those links will be directly under this episode in the show notes when you go to thesellingshow.com. Phil Jones, you're a rock star. I am honored to call you a friend. Thank you for stopping by. So many value bombs. I really appreciate you. My pleasure, my friend. And I look forward to seeing you again in real life real soon.